All right, let's get started. Let me get the lights adjusted. And there we go. All right, let's get started. Let's settle down. Welcome to week seven of the Freshman Engineering Seminar. Looks like midterms are creeping up, right? Just remember, we don't have exams in college. We have celebrations of learning. All right, um, a few quick announcements. Um, remember the New River Gorge Bridge Tour. For those of you that were interested in going, they're still planning on going. I think the weather might be a little rough, but I think as far as I know, everybody's still going. And that's uh, tomorrow. They're heading out of here at 7.15 a.m. Um, now, real quick, uh, we mentioned this last week. Um, next Tuesday, there will be an SAME Huntington Post uh, meeting on campus. It'll be in the Shockey Dining Room, uh, the Student Center, which is on the second floor. Um, you know, really good possibility to make some uh, career connections and some, uh, you know, increase some networking and whatnot, so you'll definitely want to consider that. Um, Career Expo is going to be taking place next week. It's going to be uh, October 18th in the Don Morris Room. Don't forget your quiz uh, made available later today. Now, um, a few things uh, about our speakers. Um, our main speaker, Roger Westfall, I think, oops, I, I got a name mis uh, misspelled there. Sorry about that. A little bit. Um, he's a, a speaker, or a, he's a, a, an engineer with Payne Engineering, a control systems uh, manufacturer. They're going to tell you a little bit about what they do there. But before that, again, we're going to have a faculty come up and introduce themselves. Fac uh, faculty this week's uh, a somewhat newer faculty here. His name's uh, Dr. Muataz Boker, and he's also a control systems engineer. With that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Boker. So with that, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Must be some 104 students. Hi, everyone. I see some familiar faces here. Yeah. So, OK. Uh, so my name is Mutaz Booker. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, <clears throat> I got my undergraduate studies uh, degrees from England, University of Leeds. Uh, that's my bachelor. And University of Sheffield uh, in 2002 and 2003, respectively. I did my bachelor in mechatronics engineering. That's electronics in addition to mechanics or mechanical engineering, in addition to computer uh, engineering. So it's a blend of three sciences uh, in, in one. And I did my master's in, in control systems. And then I worked as uh, in my home country. Uh, we, uh, I'm originally from Libya, North Africa. And uh, I worked for four years as an assistant lecturer. I, I assist professors with their uh, lectures and, uh, and uh, supervised number of uh, labs. And then I did my PhD uh, at Michigan State University, and I graduated in 2013 um, in electrical engineering. The focus of my PhD uh, was on control of nonlinear systems. And I'll be talking about what does it mean to, uh, to be a control engineer in, in a minute. Um, and then I worked as a postdoc at North Carolina State University. Um, and now I've been working uh, um, at Marshall University since January of this year. Uh, so I taught uh, some courses um, last semester. So I taught the uh, ENGR 104, in the engineering profession. And I'm still teaching it uh, this semester. Uh, I taught the engineering compu computation, uh, which, is a, which gives you an introduction to some popular tools uh, in engineering, like MATLAB, uh, Excel, Microsoft uh, Excel sheets, um, and how to be uh, comfortable using calculators. <clears throat> this semester also, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching uh, ME 400 and 420 instrumentation and control. So I am a more, uh, uh, my major is more in electrical engineering. But because I, uh, my concentration is control systems, um, this is one of the nice things about control systems, is that um, it is involved in many disciplines, in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, even in civil engineering. Uh, so because of my background and uh, my, uh, uh, my studies, my previous studies, I'm able to teach courses both in electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. Um, <clears throat> next semester, I'll be teaching recess methods, mechatronics, and advanced analysis too. These are all mechanical engineering uh, courses. So 
this is my research area. It's control systems. Um, the reason I, I chose control system is the reason why I chose engineering, actually, which is that I love math. And when I realized that I could use math to represent anything, anything in the world that moves, anything that moves can be represented by mathematical formula of some sort or law or concept. And I thought that that's a very powerful thing uh, to the extent that there is some talk that, that you can even control a human once you, mo you can model it perfectly using mathematics. So, and because of that, uh, because of this powerful knowledge, because of this powerful description of, of anything that moves, uh, we can come up with solutions of how to influence the behavior of that, of that thing that we are interested in. Now, the notice here, the keyword here is moves, dynamic systems, okay? Math can also describe things that do not move, static systems. Uh, civil engineering may be a perfect example of that. Bridges and structures, things that do not move, okay? Math, math is also a perfect tool uh, to describe these systems. But I'm more focused on moving parts. That's why uh, I, uh, I specialize in mechanical and electrical engineering. Uh, <clears throat> one field that embodies these principles is control systems. Control system is exactly that. It models systems using mathematics, okay, mostly, but uh, there are other simulation softwares that uh, uh, neural networks, and, but the conventional classical way to model things uh, is mathematical principles. And then using that knowledge, how can you influence the behavior of the system to your desire? Uh, uh, examples of control systems, um, the autopilot in the airplane, okay? Um, heat thermostat that you'd see in your home, um, garage opener, TV remote, uh, car cruise control, where you would like to set the speed of the car to 170 um, uh, miles per hour, and uh, self-driving cars, Tesla now is, is, is doing a great job in there, and uh, uh, a lot more, a lot, a lot, a lot more. So man, you can see a lot of examples of control systems in our daily life. And uh, uh, <coughs> so, so what is control system exactly? What is it? Well, it's, it's you have a system, uh, represented here by this box, okay? That's a plant, uh, we call it a plant, and uh, there's an assumption there that we are able to model that plant of some sort. And my assumption is that I can model that plant using mathematics. Uh, uh, there's a caveat there, there that there are other modeling techniques, okay? But my assumption in my old work is that I'm assuming that there is a way that I can describe the car, the airplane, the thing that I would like to control using mathematics. If it's not there, I need to come up with a model for that, for that thing that I would like to control. Then, uh, once I uh, give this system an input, okay, how, uh, number one, how uh, the output, w w what the output would be, so I need to determine, detect what the output would be given some input. And uh, I can close the loop if I measure the output. If I know what the output is, I can measure it either by my eyes or by a device, OK? Uh, how can I make use of that uh, knowledge to change that output to my liking, OK? So uh, this is what control system is. That, that, the whole process here is a control system. Input, a plant, or a system, and output. So just a, a quick example here. Consider the elevator. You are using the lift or the elevator, and you want to. You are on the first floor, and you want to go to the fourth floor. Okay. So the system is the elevator, and when you press the button for number four, okay, that's the input, and when you reach to number four, that's the output. So you would like to reach uh, to the fourth floor with zero error, so you don't want to be stuck in the middle, and you want to reach there as comfortable as, and as quickly as possible. So there are some variables. It's not only that I want to reach number to level four, I want to reach there in a, as a smooth way as possible. The job, 
the, the one who is responsible to do that is the control engineer. Uh, the control systems is a very, even though uh, the techniques that are widely used now in control systems are relatively new uh, relative to um, other uh, disciplines like statistics and uh, and other uh, disciplines. However, they were people have been using control concepts even before realizing that they are uh, dealing with control systems or. Uh, uh, there's no uh, well-formed uh, discipline called control systems. So here's a, a famous example by uh, James Watts in 1788, the flyboard governor. This is a typical control system. Uh, you have the steam engine here, the valve that controls the speed of the steam engine, and you have uh, the uh, uh, you have a couple of balls here, and as the engine speeds up. These balls flung up uh, due to the centrifugal uh, forces, okay? And as they flung up, the, uh, this will pull this lever up, okay? And that will close, this, uh, that will close the, the valve there, okay? And will reduce the speed of the, of the engine. So there is an automatic control of the speed, okay? Uh, 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 through this mechanism. Well, this is my current research. This is what I've been uh, doing for the last two or three years. I've been focusing more now on systems, not standalone system like this one, okay, but uh, maybe 10 out of these systems that share communication network, that speak to each other. Examples, uh, example, uh, examples of this could be uh, self-driven cars or, or vehicle formation could be swarms or, or groups of robots where you would like them to do certain task. Uh, could be the, the power grid is also another example where you would like to um, regulate the performance of, of a number of uh, power generators so that there will be no blackouts, no disconnection or, or anything in the power. So how can you regulate their performance knowing that you can control each one of them and also knowing that they speak to each other, they share some information, okay? So this generator shares its voltage uh, readings to the other generator and the other generator and so on. So uh, how can one, for example, in this case here, with two, not one centralized controller, two controllers, you can make all these robots do a certain task, okay? Uh, as secure as possible and as quick as possible and, and so on. So let me just give you quick uh, um, examples, YouTube, uh, all right. So this is the first example, multi-agent robotic control, uh, where this demonstration of what I just spoke about. So in this case here, this robot is trying to form a shape, okay? And that uh, screen there, uh, a robot is trying to follow a wall or some sort of structure. Um, again, here is a shape of uh, formation. Here, the robots are uh, trying to follow a leader, okay? To do some certain task. So. Real world examples of these is like maybe uh, when, when disaster, disaster strikes, you need to uh, send some uh, autonomous vehicles to search and rescue, okay, or do some certain tasks. Uh, so notice here that there is no remote control, okay? No one is controlling or telling the robots what to do. They are figuring out as they go what to do, okay? Uh, and uh, so uh, sometimes there might be a tower somewhere, okay, that only does the computation, okay? So that uh, it sends in every like millisecond or something the commands to, to, uh, to the individual systems. Uh, or sometimes each system has its own microprocessor that receives information, acts on it, uh, computes the command and sends it back to its neighbor. Okay, so there are more than one configuration. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's enough.
Yeah, but you get the picture, right? Okay, let me show you the other example. Now, before I do that, So this is my first uh, area of research. The second area of research, which was my, uh, my area of research during my PhD study, which is uh, control of nonlinear systems. So there are two types of systems generally. There's a linear system where the relationship between the input and output is a, is a line, okay? And there is nonlinear systems, anything else, okay? And everything in life is actually a nonlinear system. Everything, okay? Uh, people only consider linear systems because they are very easy to uh, to deal with, and they are very uh, the mathematics is very nice, okay? But only for convenience. But uh, in reality, everything is nonlinear systems. So that's why a lot of people are research when they do research, they consider nonlinear systems. So. The first thing I would like to show you. Can I try this? Is a poster I did when I was a graduate student uh, that would give you an example of my research at that time. So this is a poster um, I presented at a uh, symposium at Michigan State University. And here I'm considering this system there. This is just to give you a very, um, a, another perspective of control systems. So you have a plant or something that you need to control. You have a controller, and you have something else which is called observer. So uh, without the observer, I would use sensors, things that measure the output, the speed, uh, if I'm interested in controlling the speed, or the position, or the velocity, or what have you. However, sometimes using sensors uh, might be very expensive, might be impossible if you are uh, dealing with a nuclear reactor, for example. Okay, uh, might many reasons that might prevent you from using sensors. So you would need to use as less or as few uh, measurements as possible to determine the other measurements that you cannot detect. Uh, and there, there you can you need to use an observer. So I came up with an observer that would, so this is a, a simplification of a robotic arm, okay? And here I'm saying that if I can measure only the angle at the motor position, okay? Uh, how can I control and detect the angle at the other joints of the robotic arm without measuring, physically measuring them? Only by measuring the angle here at this joint, okay? And once I get these uh, measurements, how can I make use of them so that I can make the arm do whatever I want, okay? So basically, this is what I did. And um, the simulations here show that the dotted line is, the, uh, is my estimate of the state, and the blue line is the actual state. So here, I'm just saying, well, I, ha I have a, a, an observer, and I have a sensor. And I would like to compare the two. Uh, and you can see here, there is a... a what I call a steady state error of zero. So this is the first one, and the last example I would like to show you before I finish. Well, actually I have two examples, but they are very short. Do I, have, do I still have time? Okay. So, this is the first example, and this one, this example we have at, at Marshall. This is this one is we just purchased uh, at Marshall University. So it's called the inverted pendulum. It's a very classical control systems example. Let me go just very quickly. Again. This is highly nonlinear system. And this is similar to when you have a pen and you want to balance that on your hand. It's a similar thing. So here, 
the, the uh, objective of the uh, uh, system is to make the angle zero. Okay. Let me show you the other one, which is similar to this uh, thing, but uh, just to show you that control system can be fun too. Ping pong, go. We are controlling the force and the angle of the pendulum so that uh, if I do this like 100 or million times, it's always going to achieve its goal, okay? So that by, by controlling the angle uh, and the force of the pendulum. So I think that would be the conclusion of my presentation. And I would like to leave you with fun, one final tip. This is based on my experience as a student and based on my experience as a professor. Make use of the professor's uh, office hours. You cannot believe uh, the uh, new information you can get with one on one uh, or one to one uh, interaction with your professor okay uh, for the professor is also very valuable it gives him uh, feedback as to what are the uh, weakest uh, points of, of uh, uh, that he needs to uh, focus on so if if there is one thing that uh, I can leave you with or I would like to leave you with is this one okay thank you very much I would, I'm always very happy to uh, discuss anything related to control or anything related to mechanical or electrical engineering. And also, uh, I'm always very happy to consider um, if you have any ideas about research. And uh, by the way, there is a, a seminar on Wednesday about undergraduate research. Uh, some experiences, there's uh, a guest faculty that is going to give a seminar from one to two and the uh, EL101. Um, so I would uh, encourage everyone to attend that seminar. Uh, otherwise, I would be very happy, happy to uh, discuss any research uh, ideas or anything uh, you might be interested in. All right? All right. Thank you, Dr. Berger. Thank, thank you. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, turn it on over to our main speaker, okay. uh, Mr. Westfall. So I'm going to give him the floor. Well, good afternoon. How's everyone today? You all sound so excited. You're all freshmen. I was there once, back in 02. 1902. No, not really. <laughs> my name is Roger Westfall, and his, he had my name up on the, the board. How many of you have, know how to spell Roger? R-O-G-E-R. -E is there another way? R-O-D-G-E-R. -E I get several spellings. Westfall. How do you spell Westfall? W-E-S-T-F-A-L-L. -L. What's another way? P-H-A-L. I get that all the time, too. But I've never had a V-A-L-L. -L. That's a good one. I like that one. All right. As I said, my name is Roger Westfall. I've been around for a long time. I graduated from Bridgeport High School. How many of you know where Bridgeport High School is? It's up the road a ways in 1965. That's long before you all came about. 1965. I graduated and I went to West Virginia Institute of Technology. How many of you have heard of that school? It's basically gone now. When I went there, 
West Virginia Tech was considered one of the top 10 engineering schools in the eastern half of the country. I didn't go to Morgantown because they didn't have a good engineering program at that time. They do now because they took over Tech. But in any case, I graduated, went to Tech. How many of you are in engineering? I assume most of you are. <coughs> How many hours do you have to have to graduate? 128. How many hours a semester do you normally take? 16. When I went to Tech in electrical engineering, I had to have 142 hours to graduate in four years. Do the math. That's a minimum of 18 hours a semester. But when I went to Tech, I didn't start in engineering, electrical engineering. I started in electrical engineering technology. What's a technology program? Anybody know? Two-year program. I graduated in two-year program, which is basically all application not theory. I stayed at Tech for another four years and got my BS degree in electrical engineering. Now most of you know what engineering is about. It's a lot of theory, a lot of math. Uh, as he said, he likes math. Engineering requires math upon math upon math. If you don't like math, you're in the wrong program. Electrical engineering, that's when I graduated. Now. I used to work at Union Carbide when I was a freshman, sophomore, and junior in, high school, in college. I got summer jobs. That's how I put myself through school. Of course, back then, you didn't have to take out a loan to go to schools. Tuitions and registration fees were fairly reasonable back in those years. But I did work at Union Carbide for three years. Got a lot of experience as a grunt laborer. How many of you like to do grunt labor? I got a few of you. It taught me one important thing. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go on to college and get my degree so I didn't have to do grunt labor. But you know what? The Lord took care of me in that. I have to thank him for that. Now, I left tech with an electrical engineering degree and uh, in electrical engineering and a minor in control systems, switching circuits. How many of you know what switching circuits is about? Back then, the only computers that were around were the big, monstrous IBMs. I mean, they would fill, the, the one that we had at Tech, you'd take half of this room, and the computer that we used at Tech was, one computer filled this room. Had, you seen it on TV, you seen the old tape drives going around and around. And the disk drives that they used, do you know what kind of disks they used? They were this big. Each wafer of the disk was this big. And they had them in these little plastic cases, and you stick them down in the hole, and that's what the hard drives were. They used what they called chain printers. Big chain went round and round, print 120 lines a minute. Some of them would print 600 lines a minute. Used card readers. How many of you remember ever seeing a card reader? It's these little punch cards are about this big. That's what we used to have as computers when I was in school. But they have come a long ways. I have more power in this iPhone than they had in that stupid computer that took up the whole room. But you need to realize you're coming a long ways too. You've got a lot of stuff behind you that I didn't have. But I left tech with an engineering degree looking for a job. I had several offers. I could have offered, went back to work for Union Carbide. They wanted to send me to Texas. Didn't want to do that. I'm from West Virginia. I wanted to stay in West Virginia. I could have went to Newport New Shipyard. I could have went several different places. But I had a little company in West Virginia called Payne Engineering Company that offered me a job. That's the job I took. It's in Scott Depot. I don't know you know where Scott Depot is. Halfway between here and Charleston, there's Scott Depot. Just a little white building on the side of the road. I've been there since 1972 as an electrical engineer. Now, I started there as an assistant engineer in 1971. I advanced to chief engineer in 1978. I was appointed vice president of engineering in 1990. 
And upon the death of the president of the company, Henry Payne, I was appointed president and CEO of the company in 19 or in 2008. And I have been at that company ever since. And I have seen things that we have done, just, just blows my mind what we have done with electrical engineering components. Mainly, I wanted to go to work building computers. That's why I minored in switching circuits. I didn't end up in switching circuits. I ended up in power. Now, this little phone right here, you know how many volts this phone runs on internally? All the circuitry in this phone runs on one and a half or three volts. All your computers, your laptops, your iPads, any computer that you have today runs on five volts or three volts. Some of them are down to one and a half volts. Only problem is, is when you lower the volts and you maintain the same power, you increase the current and the heat. Uh, we've had problems lately. Uh, I just heard about this iPhone, that, or not an iPhone, it, uh, cell phone. A guy had it in his pocket on an airplane. You know what just happened to it? It exploded. It deals with high current. Low volts, high current, and a bad battery. So what we see is we need to be careful about how we use electronics. But I have looked over the years and some of the things that I have done, but mainly we deal with power. And when I say power, okay, we've got lights in this room. Do these lights have dimmers on them? Do you know? Do you know if these lights have dimmers on them? I think just the recessed lights. The recessed lights have dimmers. I guarantee you what they're using is a triac or an SCR controller to dim those lights. And the main reason is when you're dealing with higher currents and higher volts, what's that volt? What do those bulbs run on? Anybody know? You plug a light in the wall, what are you plugging into in that little receptacle? How many volts? Anybody know? 120 volts. And you go, 120 volts. Does anybody know what that means? You need to learn what that means. Because when you plug into the wall, that's 120. When you plug your dryer in, your, cl you know, your clothes dryer, your stove in the house, it runs on 220. And the business that I'm in is power controls. What we deal with mainly is 480 volts. You don't want to get bit with 480 volts. I've still got three scars right here on my hand where I got bit with 480 volts three-phase. You don't want to do that. But the whole point is, you're dealing with power. When I'm dealing with this little phone right here, I'm dealing with less than five volts. I won't get shocked. I can't get hurt. Go to your car. Everybody worries about their battery in their car. And I had a guy tell me, oh, man, I, I got to be careful. I can't touch those posts on that battery. I'll get shocked. How many volts is a battery in a car? Anybody know? 12 .5. Roughly 12.5 volts. When they're charged, they're running up to about 14 until you turn the alternator off. Then they're back down to about 12.5, 12.7. How much can your body hold? Anybody know? What's the safe level for your body? about 48 volts. That's why they call 48 volts the intrinsically safe level. Intrinsically safe means people safe. You're not going to get shot. I could take my fingers and go and hold on that 12 volt battery and you know what's going to happen? Somebody tell me what's going to happen when I hold them batteries? Nothing. <laughs> Now, this is not good. I don't recommend you do it. How do you check a 9-volt battery to see if it's charged? Put it on your tongue. Now, why do you feel that on your tongue? Yes. It's a conductor. Water is a conductor. Every one of us is a conductor. It depends on how dry your body is as to how much you're going to conduct or not conduct. The drier your body, the more voltage it takes to shock you. These are the things I've learned over the years, and we deal with that volts. We deal with how to control that volts. 
I didn't bring anything to show you because I wasn't going to present a lesson on SCR controls, but what we build at Paint Engineering Company is SCR power controls. The smallest thing we make is 10 amps, which is the size of a light dimmer for that you would put in your house. That's the smallest we make. The largest unit we make is 1,600 amps. That's about one and a half megawatts. Those might be, I would say, those are probably 60 watt light bulbs. You know how many of those bulbs it takes to make 1.6 megawatts? Actually, it's 1.3 megawatts. Lots. So when you're dealing with power, you can't use small stuff. You can't use the same type of electronics you put in one of these. So that's what we do. We build power controls for electric ovens of all types and all sizes. We've been in that business now since 1959. That's when Henry Payne started building solid state power controls. He went to Yale. His roommate went to work for GE. GE came out with an SCR. He sent it to Henry. Henry decided, oh, I can use this to build a power control, and he started that business in 1959. We're still there, right here in Scott Depot. We build power controls of all types, single phase, three, you say single phase, three phase. What's single phase, what's three phase? Look it up. You'll find out what it means. So some of the projects that we have done, one of the projects that I've really enjoyed doing over the years is called bridge deck heating. What does that mean? When I say bridge deck, what do I mean? Top of the bridge. Top of the, bridge. the part you drive on. In 1976, we put in a bridge deck heating at mile post 21 on I-64. What they did was they went in there and in, when they were rebuilding the bridge, when they poured the concrete, we went down there and we inserted heat cables into the concrete. And we built the power controls that controlled that heat deck. Now the way it works, it's got moisture sensors that we put in the road. The moisture sensor determines whether you got snow or not. It could be rain, it could be snow, who knows. It also has a temperature sensor embedded in the road. What temperature do you think you've got to have in order to melt snow? Say it louder. 33 about, well, about 33, 34. We would use 34 degrees. What's freezing? 32 degrees. So what we would do, we would embed temperature sensors in the road. You're talking about your control systems. That's what we had. We had a temperature controller. The temperature controller was set at 34 degrees. It monitored the temperature of the road. It said, I want to get this to 34 degrees. So if it was too cold, it would tell the power control to turn on more and more and put more heat to the road, the road would heat up. If it got too warm, the temperature sensor would say, oh, I'm too hot. It would tell it to not put as much heat to the road. So there is how you control the heat. So we had one bridge that we did. And another year, which we did over on, how many of you know where old Route 34 is? 35. That it's all new now. It's that new four lane they put out through there from Scott Depot over to Point Pleasant. Well, it was at mile post 24 on that road. Some of you know it as six and 20 mile creek. We put the same heat on that one. Now in that bridge, what they wanted to do was they kept it on all the time. And they wanted to make sure that even though they come through with their plow truck and they plowed the road, they didn't want the concrete to get too cold. What happens if you pour salt on concrete? It corrodes the concrete, doesn't it? After a short period of time, your concrete starts breaking up. When you drive over a bridge, is the bridge colder or hotter than the normal road that's on the ground? It'll be colder. So the concrete's colder. So if you don't want that concrete to get real cold, what do you do to it? 
heat it up. And that's what we did. They did a three-year study. The state road did a three-year study and proved that it works. Do you know why they didn't want to do it on all the rest of the bridges? What's this mean? Money. They didn't want to spend the money. So they spent the money rebuilding the bridges every so often. And they spent the money shoveling off the bridges. But they didn't want to put the heat in the road. That was one major project that I was involved in. Another one, how many of you remember the war in Iraq? When that war was over, what did we do? Rebuilt their cities, rebuilt all of their power plants. Paint Engineering builds a control that nobody else builds. There's a company in Europe that builds it, but not on a higher voltage levels. It's called a reversing contactor. Now, for those of you who have no idea what I'm saying, I have a motor that's running. Okay? When I say I want to reverse it, which direction is it going to go? The opposite direction. Well, when you have a three-phase motor, a three-phase motor, you put power to it, it is phase sensitive, which means that it looks at the power line coming in and sees which of the three phases is first, second, and third, because they're all shifted from each other. There's another math equation. They're 120 degrees apart from each other. And again, I don't have time to go into that with you. But what you see is phase A, phase B, phase C. Phase A, phase B, phase C. A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. When you put that to a three-phase induction motor, it goes in that direction. How do I want to change directions of that motor? Reverse the three phases. Instead of ABC, I'll make it CBA. And now the motor goes this way. Well, the way you do that with a mechanical contactor is just that. Mechanical contacts, A, B, and C. Here's contact A, B, and C. Line A, line B, line C coming in. I close the contactor. It puts ABC to the motor. Now, how can I change without physically grabbing the wires, taking them off with the screwdriver, changing them, how can I change that direction? A control system using another mechanical contactor that is pre-wired CBA. So I come in and I come into both contacts with ABC. I come out of this one with ABC, I come out of this one with CBA, but guess where this is going to go? I only got one motor, so I go, they're paralleled on the output with the phase shift. In a mechanical reversing contactor, they have what they call a safety bar, which means that this contact closes, this contact closes. If I have a bar on the coil, only one of them can close this one or this one if I try to close this one this bar pulls this one up it's a safety bar and so they can't reverse automatically or unsafely what we have developed is a solid state version of that we use SCR switches a B C and another set of switches C B A and they're wired exactly the same as the mechanical. There's only one problem. With the mechanical, what's the safety bar? It's physical. It's a little metal bar that connects the two. How do you connect two pieces of electronics together? Time. Make sure that the control signal never switches both of them at the same time. But there's one minor difficulty when you're dealing with solid state. I can always turn an SCR on without ever hitting a signal. Transient on the line. You cannot eliminate all the transients in the world. A transient will misfire a semiconductor. When the semiconductor misfires, what do you end up with? I got this one on, and I got this one on now. I've ended up with a dead short. You pop your fuse, if you're using a fuse. So we developed a technique using current limiters to minimize the possibility of that ever happening. We build solid state relays, reversing solid state relays. And why I brought up Iraq? 
guess where we sent approximately 150 solid state relays? To Iraq. They rebuilt all of the, Westinghouse rebuilt all of their power, their power stations, like John Amos, okay? And what kind of valves do they use in power plants? Steam valves. And they use electric valve actuators to open and close the valves for steam, okay? So what our reversing contactor is doing, it's controlling the actuation of the steam valves. So it opens it and it closes it. And there's another problem with mechanical. How fast can I open and close a mechanical relay constantly? This is, I'm turning it on and off right now. What's going to happen to this mechanical relay? It's going to wear out real quick. Solid state doesn't have that problem. You can use solid state switches to eliminate that problem. There's another problem. You better wear earplugs when you're getting close to these things. If you ever heard a mechanical relay chatter, you'll know why. It's noisy. Solid state. That's one of the projects that I worked on. Another one was a steam boiler in a building in Virginia. Now, what runs the power plant over here at John Amos? Coal. What's the coal do? Burns. What's it do? What do they use that burning coal for? Heat up water to make what? Steam. That's how turbines work in a power plant. When you look over there at John Avis and you see all that smoke coming out of those great big towers, guess what? It's not smoke. It's steam. Now, if you look at the other two smokestacks that they have, guess what's coming out of those? Not anymore. Less, less than 3% of what comes out of that is smoke. You know what the rest of it is? Steam. They use steam to clean the smoke. So you see steam coming out everywhere over there, not smoke. You get people go by and they look at that thing. First thing they think of when they see those two great big cooling towers is, man, I gotta get out of this state. They got a nuclear plant here. No, it's not nuclear, it's, it's coal. But this building in Virginia that I'm talking about, which was a project that I worked on just totally blew my mind. They didn't want to use gas to make steam. They didn't want to use coal to make steam. You know what they used? Electricity to make steam. They drove one megawatt heaters to heat steam. Now, in your house, how many of you have got electric hot water tanks? In your parents' house or wherever you live. What is the elect how do they make hot water? With an electric heater. They got a heater inside that water, and when you put volts to it, it creates current, creates heat. What happens? You've got hot water. Now, let's say that I turn that on. Instead of having a 4,500-watt heater, I put a 1,000 times that watt heater in my hot water tank. What am I going to create? A bomb. Uh, yeah, a bomb. That's exactly right. Lots of steam. This is what they did in this building in Virginia. They wanted to use, and my first question to the contractor that was doing this that came to me for this project, I said, let me ask you a question. What are you doing with the steam? Well, they're driving a steam turbine to create electricity. They're creating electricity. They're using electricity to heat the water that makes the steam to create the electricity. Are we done? Okay, I'm, I'm just about finished. So, what did I say? What are you using electric for? You know what their reason was? Remember, remember, this is a government building. Mm -mm. Had nothing to do with money. What's the big thing today? Anti-coal Anti -coal and pollution. They wanted no pollution in this, from this building. No, no gas fire, no coal fire. Electricity was great. 
And I thought, okay. Does anybody ever heard the term efficiency? Poor in this case. All right, the last thing was the one that I really enjoyed the most is this occurred about, how many of you have ever heard of Six Flags in uh, Los Angeles? Six Flags. There's Six Flags around, but there's one in Los Angeles. They've got a ride there called Superman Great Escape. Have you ever heard of it? It's a, it's a ride. They start out in the flat. They put you in this car, and they get you up to 100 miles an hour before you reach the end of two football fields. And then it turns straight up, and you go straight up for 450 feet. You started out at zero, and you went to 100 in 600 feet. That ride, we built the switches. What they used was one and a half megawatt inverters to drive the switches, the motors on this ride. They were induction motors, and I'm not going into that. They're called linear induction motors. No moving parts. It's all magnetic. That was right. I went out there twice, spent two weeks out there when they built this thing, and it was really something to see how they put that together. Superman Great Escape. That was one of my last great projects that I really enjoyed. I'm done. Real quick. Go ahead and let me stop this recording. Uh, oh, sorry. Sign in sheet.